I want to welcome you to Dream Chasers Radio with me, your host, Yaya Diamond. What's up, peoples? How you doing? Yes, it's a great day. I am telling you, I am so excited about my next guest on the show today. Mr. Lloyd E. Gross is here. Welcome to the show, sir. Thank you, Yaya. Thank you. How's your day going? It's going. <laughs> it's going. <Okay. laughs> It's going it's going in a better direction than it went last week, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> well that's good. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah. So tell me about yourself. Okay, first of all, I am a retired Lutheran pastor. I uh, have been in the ministry after forty years of active service there. I retired in twenty oh eight. Wow. And I was pastor at Christ Lutheran Church in Cleveland, Ohio at that time where I had been since 1979. Uh, the seminary I went to was Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. And I did my undergraduate work at Valparaiso University in Indiana. Mm -hmm. I have lived uh, in the Cleveland area since 1979 now. Wow. I am a widower. I have two children and two grandchildren. Wow. Wow. You know, what is it like to finish a book? Because I know you're a published author now. What is it like to finish a book and be like the limelight of your your grandchildren's eyes? <laughs> <laughs> First of all, it's a relief that it's done. I hear you. Yeah. Uh, secondly, remember, writing is is a hobby for me. It's not the way. It's not what I do for a living. So it's definitely a, a second uh, pursuit. Mm -hmm. And yet it's one in which I have a great deal of interest. Okay. And, of course, this book was trying to come out of me for a long time, although in many, many different ways, because it's a rather complex book. Mm -hmm. It takes care of three generations. And, of course, the backstory includes the fourth. Wow. It covers a, a period of time from... 1909 to 1977, and that includes the epilogue. Hmm. Hmm. I don't put myself in it. I'm not a character in it. Okay. Uh, I suppose things that I would like to be are characters in it, <laughs> but I myself am not a character in it. Okay. okay. Uh, it takes place in New Orleans, which is where I grew up. Okay. And, you know, I haven't lived there since uh, since I was seventeen, really. Wow, you know, I was just I was curious about the name of the book. Okay, there is a reference to that when you get to the part called Part Three, uh, W O P R. The main character in that part of the book likes fried oyster sandwiches. Okay, and I happen to mention. And it looked like something very New Orleansy, and therefore a good handle for the book. Oh wow, wow! I've never had one of those. <laughs> you haven't? You don't no. know what you missed. I, I am allergic. <laughs> I'm allergic to shellfish, so I, I think I'm good. <laughs> oh, well, then don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. No, don't do it. it. <laughs> no, don't do it. Oh my gosh! But wow. Okay, so tell me. T I mean, you know. Okay, so you did seminary. You 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 know. You married you your widow. I'm I'm so sorry for your loss. But you had a really really cool like life. But why didn't you put yourself in the book? Because I didn't think I was that interesting. Really? And because I wanted to really push the things that I wish I could have been. Uh, well, okay, so tell me about that. Not that I'm dissatisfied with my life. No, I'm very satisfied with it and very happy with it. Uh-huh. Uh, okay, I was at Valparaiso where I met my wife. Her name was Christine, and she was from the Bronx. And uh, after, after we got married, we lived for a while in uh, St. Louis, which is where my seminary was. She was a dietitian at that time. She worked at, um, I think, St. Luke's Hospital. We had our daughter in 1968. Shortly after that, I went and served two parishes down in the Ozarks. 
One was in Black River, Missouri, which is no longer called that. I think it's called Park Hills now. But when I lived there, it was called Black River. Mm-hmm. The other was in Bonterre, Missouri, B-O-N-N-E-T-E-R-R-E, which is still called that, which is French for good land. Okay. Um, in 1971, I was called to a church in Van Wert, Ohio, which is a rural county seat about maybe 30 miles from the Indiana border. And I served Emmanuel Church there for seven years. It was while I was there that my son was born in 1971. And those are my two children, my daughter Marie and my son Eugene. Mm -hmm. Um, They both live within eight miles of me now. So I'm happy about that. Oh, definitely. Uh, do I miss New Orleans? Well, I miss it in the way that I can never recover it. Yeah. Uh, it's not just Katrina, although Katrina was deadly. Yeah. But there are other things that, that I mean it's just not there anymore. Yeah. I uh, I used to love to go out to West End, for example, mm-hmm. to go down West End Boulevard and then cross over the New Basin Canal okay. and then go into West End Park where there was some great restaurants out on Lake Pontchartrain. Uh-huh. Uh, that's all gone now. Those restaurants were all taken down by Katrina. The park was inundated and is no longer a park. So there are things in New Orleans I could never do that I would have loved to have done. Mm. But they're gone. Now, oh. I do remember them. I remember them well enough to write about them. And I hope to save them for posterity in what I wrote. Right. Okay. Wow. Well, would you like to know any more about me or should we get to the book? You know, I'm just, I'm thinking, I, I was just thinking to myself, why don't you think you're interesting? I mean, literally, I thought that was kind of cool. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. maybe i know to, myself too well i i think so i mean literally i'm like okay wait a minute why doesn't he not think he's interesting i don't understand oh i think it's because i know myself too well i'm used to myself and oh, it yeah. keeps me being interesting to myself for, for that reason i think everybody feels that way in one aspect or another. And I mean, you know, everybody feels like they're not interesting, but at the same time, it's like, okay, your life is so interesting that I, I think it's a travesty that you didn't write about it. Are you going to write about your life in the future? I don't know how much time I have left. Uh, I, I have a couple of ideas for other stories, although not a full length novel. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and I have idea even for a sequel to Fried Oyster Sandwich. Okay. And uh, to understand that, you have to understand what Fried Oyster Sandwich is based yeah, on. Yeah, please tell me. It's an alternative history. And that's the key word there. It's an alternative history. Okay. It's a history in which the Confederates win the war between the states mm. and become a separate republic. And the two republics grow up together and become good friends because they still have all the railroad tracks that connect the cities between them. They still have a common railroad gauge. Uh, they, they still have a lot of things in common. They are separate republics. They have separate governments. But they are allies hmm. and probably intend to remain allies. Wow. And although they did have a little talk about trying to include Canada in it, they understand Canada belongs to the Brits, that uh, they have their own discussions as far as that concerns. Mm-hmm. Wow. All right. So that's the background of it. Mm-hmm. Um, in this background, New Orleans is about the most important port city in the Confederacy. Okay. Now, a lot of what goes on in this book has to do with church, religion, theology, things like that. Uh-huh. Because the three generations that, uh, that grow up here are all Lutheran. 
beginning with the first guy, uh, George, who is the minus one generation, if you wish, uh, is not really backstory. He's actually a character in the first part of the book. Okay. And uh, George came from St. Louis because economic opportunity beckoned him to the South. And he became captain of the Jackson Avenue Ferry. He was in the Merchant Marine, and through the Merchant Marine, he made contacts and found out they were looking for somebody to captain the Jackson Avenue Ferry. So he accepted that and made a very nice living with it. He lived in the Garden District. Mm -hmm. Okay. When we start the story, it's 1909, and his son, whose name is Eric, is 20 years old. He's a student at Tulane University in the School of Journalism. Uh, and while he's there, he meets Stephanie, okay. who turns out to be his life partner. Stephanie, who is half Cherokee and comes from Tulsa. And she's like you know, three years behind in, in school. But they are good friends, and they go for walks in Audubon Park and things like that. And eventually, they marry. Hmm. Uh, he gets a job for the newspaper. Uh, Eric gets a job for the newspaper, with the newspaper. And he is worried about hurricanes and thinks about them a lot. Okay. So much so that the mayor appoints him to a committee about hurricane preparedness and about the levees and how levees should be maintained. Right. He should. <laughs> he does well with it. He does well with, with his uh, work. Stephanie stays home and they have two children. They have uh, Henry, who's born in 1913. And then they have um, Linda, was born in 1916. Those are their two children. Okay. I don't take them much beyond that because the story really with them transfers to the next generation as you get to chapter four. Okay. About hmm. 13 years go by. And we're out at Lake Puncher Train at one of the camps. I don't know if you know what the camps are or were. Well, there's still some. Uh, but they're wooden, one-story buildings that are built on piers out in the lake. Okay. And at one time, there were like five miles of them along wow. the lake shore. At this time, uh, 1926 to be exact, three years after the Industrial Canal was built, uh, they're at the camp, which is east of the canal, uh -huh. and there's a bridge over the canal. And trains that are crossing the canal always blow the whistle before they cross the bridge. Okay. Now, one day, Henry is walking. He's, of course, it's summertime. He's out of school, and he's walking out there across the causeway to the street. And he sees a girl walking along the track. Uh-huh. And it's not a girl he knows. Not at all. But eventually, he comes to the realization that there's going to be a train coming soon and she should get out of the way. Okay. And he doesn't think she knows about it, so he goes up there to tell her about it. And that's where Henry meets Renee. Ooh. These are the two main characters for chapters four, five, and six. Or books, or you know, parts four, five, and six, chapter four, five, and six, whatever you want to call it. Right. Um, he's thirteen and she's twelve. When they, when he gets there and talks to her, she starts to run. And you can't really run on railroads. Right. So she trips and falls. He picks her up and carries her, and then they they hear the train coming, and he has to get them off of the track. Unfortunately, the only place to go is the swamp. Oh. But they do. They go into the swamp, the train passes, and then they can go back up on the track. 
Mm-hmm. So call it a cute need if you wish, whatever you want to call it. But this is how they get together. And they are attracted to one another. Wow. They have some awkwardness about that, needless to say. Uh-huh. And putting it into words is virtually impossible because it's never happened before. They're not really sure what, what they're up against. But uh, they are attracted to each other. Nice. He takes her to his camp. His mom is there, and they meet his mom. His sister is there, and they meet his sister. Um, after a while, she goes back to the camp where she was staying, which was two camps down. And it was the camp that belonged to her friend who lived next door to her at home. Uh-huh. The friend's Parents and her parents are friends with each other. So they go to, to this camp, which was called Gingerbread. Incidentally, Henry's camp was called Tulsa because that was his mother's hometown. Mm-hmm. Um, the parents meet the parents, and everybody likes everybody. Mm. It turns out that even the little kids, um, Renee doesn't have any siblings. But her friend Dorothy does. And her uh-huh. friend Dorothy is her hostess at that camp. She has two little siblings. And Henry, of course, has Linda. And all of these children uh, become friends with each other. Okay. I'm going to skip to Chapter 5. Mm-hmm. By this time, Henry and Renee know they like each other. They correspond. Uh, it's the day before Mardi Gras, and he challenges her to a bicycle race at her house, which is down in the Upper Ninth Ward. His house is in Edgewood. Hers is in the Upper Ninth Ward. Okay. He goes there on his bike, and after all sorts of treats, which um, Renee's mom makes, being a Cajun, she makes a lot of treats, um, After lunch, they do race. And in the course of the race, while uh, they're pretty close to being neck and neck, Renee hits a chuck hole and bounces off of her bike. And Henry stops, goes back, sees if she's all right, which she is. She's fine. Um, And then they go walking to the goal because uh, she says, well, you would have won anyway. (laughs) And he accepts that, so they walk to the goal. And, yes, he's chivalrous about this. He's very chivalrous about this. Uh, What else can I say here? They, of course, have a number of discussions about their favorite topic, which is writing short stories. And the topic that has most concern for them, which is the difference in their religion. She's Catholic and he's Lutheran. Needless to say, this topic comes up whenever either one of them visits the other. So it's important in their lives. Mm -hmm. Okay, now to chapter six. Chapter six has them in high school. Uh, He graduates first because he's a year older. And uh, she graduates second and is the valedictorian in her class. And in her valedictory address, she mentions the fact that Henry saved her from the train, which kind of embarrasses him. And uh, she says she certainly didn't mean to do that. And he says, well, he's certainly glad it happened. However, I didn't do it for credit. And uh, Somehow they both managed to get through this little trial. She invites him to dinner at her house, and they end up also getting married. Wow. Wow. Well, you, okay, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop you because I don't want you to tell the whole story. But this okay. seems so cool. Like, this is like <laughs> the love story of all love stories. Like, Really? It's just, it's, to me, this is a one. They're I only 13 and 12 when it starts. And I then mean, the bicycle race is uh, the following Mardi Gras. 
Right. So it's nine months later. Right. So, I, so. I have friends of mine who literally met each other in middle school, and they're married today. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Well, so good. this is so cool. That's good. It's so cool. It's just so cool. Wow, wow. So, so I'll tell you, every couple in my book that gets married stays married. I hope so. They do. They stay married to the end of the story. That is so cool. That is so cool. Wow. wow. It isn't until chapter 10 that they have the hurricane. Mm-hmm. And that's told is from a child's viewpoint. Okay. Because that's being told by Henry and Renee's children. All right. Chapter 10, Henry and Renee are grown up. They have three kids. And the kids are like um, eight, six, and four when the hurricane hit. Wow. And it's, he told Martin is the boy. He's the only boy. He's the middle child. And even though it's not, uh, it's not a narrative, it's not a first-person narrative, it's a third-person telling it. But it's uh, from his viewpoint. It's telling it from what he sees. Right. Wow. Wow. Well, I want to thank you, Mr. Gross, for being on the show, for writing such an amazing book, but you now have to write about your life. Oh, I don't know. (laughs) Actually, the next thing I was going to write about in the sequel was how the Union and Confederacy got together again and became one nation. Oh, well, that would be kind of, wow. Wow, that would, yeah. That would definitely and I have wow. to, I have to have a boy and a girl, one from each nation, to um, to be a microcosm of it. Right. Yes, you do. Wow. Well, Mr. Gross, <laughs> wow, you have a vivid imagination. I love it. And I can't wait for you to be back on the show to share your next book with us. Well, thank you, Yaya. Awesome. God so, bless and keep you. You too. And we're going to go ahead and have all of your information about the book in the description box below so that people can easily find it and get that fried oyster sandwich. <laughs> well, one thing one thing I want to make clear, too, and that is that my sister illustrated it. Oh, cool. My sister, whose name is Peggy Beckwith, and she lives in Knoxville, Tennessee. And she uh, was the illustrator of this book. It was only like a, 10 illustrations. But she's the one who drew them, and that includes the cover. Wow. Wow, that is so cool. That's so cool to have an illustrator in the family. I can't draw worth nothing, so I always have to hire somebody to do something for me. <laughs> but <laughs> that is so cool. So, Mr. Gross, thank you again so much yeah. for being on the show. And congratulations on everything, and we can't wait to have you back. All right, guys, don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. And until next time, don't forget to dare to be different.